Hello, everyone. I'm really pleased to join you today for this important panel on how we can build health equity right here in Memphis, Tennessee. In order to understand how we can build equity, we first need to spend a little bit of time thinking about what produces health disparities. Where do they come from? What causes them? In short, health disparities are caused by social inequalities. These inequalities result downstream in disparate rates of diabetes, obesity, hypertension, stroke, asthma, and even infant mortality. And as Dr. Woods mentioned, that includes uh, COVID-19 infection rates. When we look at these disparities, what we need to recognize is that they are not matters of accident. They are matters of powerful social forces that were deliberately shaped to reflect the values of our society. We can measure the justice of our society in the bodies of our people. I'm gonna share my screen just to show you a little bit about what that measurement looks like concretely. What you're looking at right now is a redlined map of Memphis. For those of you uh, familiar with redlining, you'll know that this was a practice of the federal government in the 1930s. And it was designed to determine which neighborhoods were worthy of public and private investments that would ensure that their residents had access to the resources they needed to flourish, to education and transportation and employment opportunities. Neighborhoods that were ranked A and B are colored in green and blue. Those were higher income and middle class neighborhoods. Neighborhoods that were ranked C and D were the ones considered too risky for public and private investment. And those are colored in yellow and red. These were lower income neighborhoods. I think it's disturbing for us to come to terms with the idea that as a matter of policy, we decided to defund precisely the neighborhoods that could most benefit from investment. But even more disturbing for that is learning that even a middle class neighborhood would be redlined if its residents were racial and ethnic minorities. Redlining was a practice written into Federal Housing Authority policy that was designed to defund Black and immigrant neighborhoods. If you want to get yourself oriented here, the easiest thing to do is find the green square in the middle of the map. That is Overton Park. You can see from there that the Evergreen and Central Garden neighborhoods are ranked B and A. Uh, Chickasaw Gardens, the University District, and East Memphis are also labeled A and B. But look at the redlined areas on this map. You can see just to the east of Overton Park, Binghampton. To the north, you'll find Nutbush, Hyde, Smoky City, Klondike, and Uptown. Then look across the south part of the map, South Memphis and Orange Mound. When you look at this map carefully, you see that it is a map of our affluence and poverty that matches what we have in Memphis today. Now, if you can imagine taking a map of our health disparities, hotspotting our rates of asthma, diabetes, and so forth, you would find that those maps overlay on this one with an almost perfect match. In fact, this is a map from early June of our COVID-19 infection rates. By the way, yesterday's map looks pretty much just like this one. I chose this one because I find it visually easier to orient myself to. What you see in this map is that our COVID-19 infection rates match precisely our redlined maps of Memphis. When you put them side by side, by the way, that is the map from yesterday. <laughs> when you put them side by side, you see that these are the same maps. What this means is that our decisions decades ago to defund Black and immigrant neighborhoods and our choice centuries ago not to value the lives of those who are impoverished sets us up for predictable rates of COVID-19 infection, but it also sets us up for all kinds of other disparities. That's the bad news. The bad news is that according to our values, we have constructed a society in which injustices are born in the bodies of our people in predictable and terrible ways. But that's also the good news, believe it or not. The good news is that this is not natural. These disparities don't result from genetic differences. These disparities were made by us and they reflect our values. If we hold different values, if we want to uplift those living in poverty, if we want to end racism and xenophobia, then we could construct a society in which we see equity where we now see disparities. 
Our panelists today are actively working to build equity in Memphis, and they are here to help us understand how this is possible. I'm gonna ask each of you to introduce yourselves, giving us your name, where you're from, and your role building equity in Memphis. We'll start with Jenny Bartlett Prescott. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for uh, attending this event. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name is Jenny Bartlett Prescott. I'm originally from Atlanta, but came many moons ago to attend Rhodes College and have stayed since then. So I consider myself a Memphian at this point. Um, my role at Church Health is the Chief Operating Officer. Um, and I'm also the one of the lead um, people helping co collaborate among our safety net clinics to provide community testing for COVID on our joint task force. So that has definitely been taking quite a bit of my time these days. Hi everyone, my name is Lillian O'Gary. I was born and raised in Kenya, but I've lived in Memphis for about 15 years, a little bit over 15 years. So I call myself a Memphrican, a combination of Memphis and African. Um, I currently serve as a program chair of biomedical sciences and an associate professor of biology at Baptist College of Health Sciences. I previously worked with the health department for about five years as a chronic disease epidemiologist. So during my time there, I work on several projects, but one notably which applies to today is the sub-county analysis of life expectancy uh, with CSTE. And I supported some other local projects and community health record as well. But my biggest achievement there, really, I can say, is being able to set up a process to be able to visualize uh, chronic diseases, life expectancy, leading causes of death, and economic hardship index. So what is economic hardship index? This is just an easier way to be able to look at social determinants of health by putting the key determinants together in an index. And this allowed us to be able to tell a story and identify areas of concern within a community and allow the stakeholders to be able to distribute resources in a much effective manner. So one of the maps that, you, that Kendra just showed, that is a template that I created while I was with the health department. So that I'm glad to see that they're still using that. As for COVID, I'm currently serving as, serving as an epidemiology resource for Baptist Memorial Healthcare Corporation, where I've created a process of contact tracing for employees so that we can keep our employees and our patients safe. At the same time, I'm also managing, helping manage uh, like, you know, outbreaks that we have within the system. Thank you for having me. Hello everyone, my name is Sandra Madabon. I'm originally from Nigeria, but I've lived most of my life in the United States because I've lived, I lived in New York for 16 years and I've lived in Memphis for 14 years. So I work with um, Methodist Healthcare System. I'm the Senior Director, Social Determinants of Health. I guess this is my name, actually, what we're talking about today. Um, I'm so glad to be in this forum because we know the impact of health in our neighbors, in our community. So we have to address it. Methodist is in the forefront of making sure that we take care of our vulnerable population, our neighbors in the community. We have a lot of things that we've set out to make sure that we are partnering with people, with everyone, to make sure we take care of people's health, we take care of our neighbors, we put programs in places to make sure that we are taking care of the health of the population. I'm so excited because we have a lot going on in this area. Thank you for having me. Welcome, Lisa. I think you're next. Well, I'm, I'm on video and unmuted. So I think it's on your end to make the changes. We can hear you just fine. Go for it. Sure. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Elisa Househalter, and I have the uh, pleasure of serving as the Director of Health for Shelby County. I'm originally from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and lived in a community that was primarily Eastern European immigrants. So I'm very familiar from my own childhood of the impact of redlining on communities. So I appreciate that example earlier from Kendra. 
I'm excited to be here as well because while we know there are significant um, challenges within Memphis and Shelby County, there are also significant things happening. So I appreciate New Memphis for hosting this panel and focusing on the things that we're doing well so that we can continue to improve health for all uh, within our community. And I'll turn it over to Kathy Pope next. Thank you very much. I'm honored to be here and sitting here going, I can't even believe I've been invited among all of these folks. I'm just really um, so honored to be part of this community. I've been here for exactly a year. I moved here last August. So I'm, was, um, so I'm the president and CEO of Mid-South Food Bank. We handle 31 counties. Um, we've really been, been focusing, obviously, since COVID and feeding folks that need food in those 31 counties. I was previously um, president and CEO at Feeding the Gulf Coast. That's the food bank that serves South Alabama, South Mississippi, and the Panhandle of Florida. I went through Hurricane Michael in um, a couple of years ago in Bay County, Florida. So I learned a lot about responding to a disaster. So I've really, those skills kicked in in March when we um, started looking toward this COVID-19 pandemic that we're in right now. Uh, one thing that I've noticed about, um, about Memphis and Shelby County is I find the need to be greater than it was on the Gulf Coast. So here, 44% of our children live in poverty along the Gulf Coast, it's about 25%. Um, higher poverty, higher level of need. Um, and so we really have to kick into action of getting enough food in the food bank. And we're called a food bank because it's exactly what we do. We get the food in the food bank and then we distribute it out among our partner agencies of which we work with about 160 partners in Shelby County. Um, and so we've got those brick and mortar pantries that prior to the pandemic, people could go to in their neighborhood the pantry may be open, you know, Tuesday and Thursday, nine to 12 or something, but the need has been so great since March. We really kicked into action of doing mobile pantries where we are targeting neighborhoods that do not have access to food. So we put a map out of Shelby County and um, looked at where we were distributing food. And then we sought out additional partners where we weren't present in those neighborhoods. So we have some new partners that we've worked with to get food out to those who need it. One example is we weren't really serving the Hispanic population very well. And now we have two new partners. One of them is distributing to a thousand households in one distribution. So we've really been able to get a lot of food out the door during um, this pandemic. And in fact, we're distributing more than three times the amount that we would have distributed prior to the pandemic. I'm so happy that people know and notice the importance of nutritious food to the health of those who are struggling with hunger. So if your budget will not allow you to shop um, along the outer part of the grocery store, the fresh produce, we have increased the amount of fresh produce that we're getting in the door um, more than a, we've more than doubled it since um, two years ago. So we're concentrating on where is the produce um, and making sure that we're getting those out to those who need it. So, uh, um, and I'll talk a little bit later about some of the um, some of the new partners that we've had. But one thing I'm very happy about is our partnership with YMCA, who is feeding our children. Um, that federally funded program, that after school program, they've been getting meals to children and we have partnered with them to feed the whole family at some of their locations. So um, I'm thrilled to be in Memphis. I love, I love this town already. Uh, very welcoming. I already feel like it's my home, although I miss the beach and I miss the bay <laughs> along the Gulf Coast, but um, I find it to be a very generous community and I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists. Um, what I want to do is jump in a, with a question that really drafts off of what Kathy was just saying, and that is that 
we know that uh, Memphis is already a place that is experiencing significant disparities and that um, the demands on our food bank and our other safety net services were already pretty high. But now in the midst of a pandemic, we're finding that many of those circumstances have been exacerbated. So I'm curious if some of you can speak to the ways in which you have seen COVID-19 sort of magnifying some of the challenges that we were already facing. I mean, I'm happy to go first and, and be quick about it. Um, you know, this is, a, this is a topic we could spend the whole hour talking about. Um, it's just how our disparities have been magnified. Um, I do hope that well, in one way, because of the work of the pandemic and even just the way that, that the virus spreads, it has very quickly, I think, brought home the message that we are all interconnected. So my health is very much connected to the health of my neighbor. And whether there's a red line between my neighborhood and their neighborhood, doesn't really matter if we're at the same grocery store. Um, and so that is something that I hope we will build on is this increased awareness of our interconnectedness and the need to care about each other's health. Um, at Church Health, we're one of the things that, that we have particularly seen that is not exactly COVID related, but is very much tied to it is the huge amount of unemployment, which of course, immediately translates into higher levels of uninsured care because people lost their employer-sponsored coverage, which is what our health system relies on. And so all of our safety net clinics, which have been called upon to do COVID testing, are also now being called upon to take care of people who now do not have their insurance plans any longer, and they get sick or hurt, and they're coming to us. So, you know, that has exacerbated a problem that already was existing with our level of uninsured. And we have even more now because of the um, employer, the loss of employer-based coverage as just an example. Uh, this is Elisa and I'll go next. One of the key things that we've clearly seen as a result of COVID is increased challenges around housing specifically. Um, when an individual is required to be isolated if they're diagnosed with COVID or if they're required to quarantine, if they're a contact, um, they have to have a place to stay. And if someone is already experiencing homelessness, it makes it much more challenging. And while we have had a um, significant number of partners come to the table, we have found it challenging to find housing, even in motels, particularly for individuals who are diagnosed with COVID then you can complicate that when we have individuals who are released from 201 Poplar, we need to make sure they have adequate housing as they're transitioning back to assure that they don't have, have COVID. A lot has been done in this work, but in this area, but that's one area we have significant work still to do. I'll probably go next. So I'm not gonna talk about the problem, I'm gonna talk about commend the community talk about how Shelby County has come together to put resources together to help our community. And I was today I was just looking at different sites and I saw like, you know, there's a COVID uh, site with Memphis government. There's a, a site also within the Shelby County government, the Shelby County Health Department with a ton of resources that are available for our community. It's just a matter of like, do, do, does everybody know what's there for them? And it's a long list of everything. You're talking about like, you know, where to get the food, if you're having struggles with paying rent, if you're, your education support. So that's one thing that, you know, I'm, I'm very proud to be in Shelby County just because that, you know, we have, we, we brought it up to help and support our people. Okay, I'll take it. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, why COVID are brought to, light everything that is going on. We already know that the prevalence of some chronic diseases are just significant with African-American and Hispanic population. Diabetes, we have 18% in non-Hispanic more. We have 16.8% in our Hispanic population compared to the 9.6% in our um, uh, Caucasian counterpart. We are already set up from the beginning.
to feel the impact of COVID before COVID hit. We also know that we are actually the essential workers, African-Americans and, and uh, Hispanic population. We are the ones that do the job of cleaning. We work in the hotels, we work in the restaurant. So we are already said that when COVID hit, all these places closed up. There is no money, there is no way to make income. So people are not eating, eating healthy. So the other people that have pre-existing condition are the first people for COVID to attack. And we are all surprised about the numbers, but we shouldn't be because we've been already set up for this to happen. So what do we do about it is the next question. What do we do with the situation? But we already know that we are predisposed to be impacted by COVID, to be impacted for the fact that we don't make enough money anymore and the job is completely taken away. So it's no surprise that we are the population that was highly impacted by COVID. Let's think then about how the sort of wraparound community services that all of you represent um, contribute to um, building equity. How do they help us um, sort of manage the, this crisis? But then also what other kinds of inequalities are being exposed? And Sandra has already sort of alluded to some of these, but if we can think about the, when, we, when we're looking at social determinants of health, we're really thinking beyond the clinic, beyond the medical setting, how do social forces shape our health? And that means that we need services that address, yes, medicine, but also education and transportation and food access and all these sorts of um, other forces that need to be part of a wraparound solution. And so if each of you could speak just a little bit to how do um, our wraparound services help us manage these challenges, but then also what do those wraparound services expose about underlying inequalities? This is Elisa, I can go first. I'm gonna really speak to the joint task force. One of the things that's very unique about our COVID response in Shelby County is we have the Memphis and Shelby County Joint Task Force but that is not limited to um, public health or healthcare systems. We have many partners at the table and um, including um, Kathy Pope from the Food Bank. We also have individuals that represent housing. We clearly have the safety net providers. Jenny's very active in that as well. And I think what has been clear through the process of having a joint task force is we've continued to add partners so that we're adequately addressing all of the needs of our community when a need is identified, that's elevated and partners come together to, to determine how best to solve that. What I do think has come out of it as sort of a pandemic within a pandemic is really the lifting of voices around the issue of structural racism in Shelby County and particularly the Shelby County Commission um, did pass a resolution that um, clearly and explicitly stated racism is a pandemic the city followed with an ordinance. And so I think we've been able to elevate the larger structural issue so that we can continue to work on that collectively. And perhaps the joint task force model is one we can replicate to solve other issues um, as a community um, together. You know, I, I think my experience of being on the joint task force has definitely um, given me heart that there's actually a path forward when we all have a collective goal, we can get a lot of things done. Um, and just like Dr. Househalter mentioned, the Joint Task Force has representatives from basically all aspect of society. It has the housing and the transportation and the energy and the education partners and health partners and all of those pieces, food, childcare. You know, and we're all pointed in the same direction to try to control this pandemic in our community. And so then it makes me wonder, well, what if we had a joint task force on education? What if we had a joint task force on housing? What if we had a joint task force on poverty that had this kind of coming together across all segments of Memphis and Shelby County? We have every single municipality there. 
Um, and, and there definitely is this sense of we're all in it together. But the other thing that it brings to mind, and I, I know I've heard Ken Robinson um, here in Memphis speak of this before, oftentimes with social determinants of health, we wanna just tackle one at a time. Do we tackle education first? Do we tackle transportation first? Which one is most important? And the hard answer is, is that they're all important. And so we have to tackle them all simultaneously because they're all interconnected. And, um, and, and what COVID has taught me is that if we have a common goal, we can actually get something done. Um, and it's, we have a lot of smart, talented, um, committed people here in Shelby County. Uh, we just, we just got to have that one common goal to all point in the same direction. I will echo what um, Dr. Householder and Jenny said as far as being part of the task force and being new to the community. Um, what I've seen is just that that desire to come together and be helpful and provide people what they need to move forward and um, do it in the very best equitable way possible. And um, I've really learned a lot about the community just being on the task force, but for us, um, you know, food is what we do. There's a lot of problems in the world. There's um, a lot of, you know, I want to build a house for people. I love Habitat for Humanity, and I want to I want to help the children with education. Like, we want to do so much, and I find it hard to just kind of stay in my lane. Um, and yes, we want to provide food, but what I've found about the, the food bank and how it is thought of in the community, and I was so happy that I'm coming into a situation that the food bank is highly thought of, highly respected here. So I didn't have any real hurdles to climb other than get more food in the door. Um, but I really find it, um, it is a way to bring people together no, we don't provide housing, but in working with our um, partner agencies, we really make sure that they are try to ensure that they have enough information that they can take a family living in poverty and then help the, and help them in other ways besides just food. So we are kind of stepping out of that box of, oh, well, we do food. Um, so that we can learn about the community. What is out there? For example, the um, pandemic EBT was extended through August 14, and this is for families to apply for this, and it take and it puts money on their EBT card that makes up for that meal, the two meals, the breakfast and lunch the kids are missing at school. Well, that's important information for families to have. So we really feel like another extension of our job of other than yes, get food out the door is to be a convener of what is all happening in the community and what is available for our families and making sure that they know that. And I think a good way to do that is the, I've learned a lot through the task force. I'm on another safety net committee with some other nonprofits in town. And so what I really find about Memphis is the working together um, to meet the needs of our families and our children. So it's been really um, so wonderful to see that and be on the front line of that. So I do think we're doing a lot right. I'm gonna jump in here. We've already established that health equity is the state of all persons having um, a fair opportunity to be as healthy as possible. We've already established that social determinants of health is the um, uh, conditions or the environments in which people are born, where they live, where they worship, play, and all that together. As a big organization in the community and other organizations too, I'm calling for people to claim and have partnership with one another because we've already, a lot of people are working. We've been tackling all these things, but for it to make a huge impact, we all have to come together instead of working in silos. And what that means is reaching a wider population. For example, Methodists have reached out, we have this partnership with Lamoy Owen now to take care of our students. Remember, the younger ones don't even go to the doctors, they don't know uh, what is going on with their body. And by the time you know it, they get to an older age and they have all these health conditions. So we are putting a nurse in the system in the school to make sure 
their health is being taken care of. This is one thing that is gonna help with the health equity uh, that we're talking about. We have a partnership with University of Memphis because we are, what Met Methodist system have done is we increase the wage the, for our associate to pay them more. But that's just one thing we've done. How will this impact our associates on the long run? The associates that are not making enough money, what the system have done is to establish this, um, this uh, powerful collaboration with University of Memphis that we set up a situation where anybody in the system that wants to go back to school, I'm not talking about tuition reimbursement which is general, but we have this strategic partnership that they can either learn to be in one phase of the classes or the other, so that generally this can impact them later on to be able to move up the ladder to make more money. That's something that is very important. We also partner with um, green and healthy home initiatives to make sure that some of our clients that we are taking uh, care of, that their homes are being fixed when they have a leakage and they're paying MLGW that is about $1,000, which is due to the fact there are leakages and there are every other thing. So they're as big organization, I think we all have to leap and make sure we are strategically doing things that will impact the health of the population, the conditions where all everybody lives. Then let's talk about, we are talking about all these things. Let's think about uh, food insecurity in our community. We just saw um, a um, grocery store open, uh, closed up. I was in tears when I saw that. We have to partner strategically with people that will say, hey, we are going to build a grocery store in this neighborhood. It's not going to make money for us. So that you don't build a, a grocery store and after four years, you find out that you're making, not making money, you close it up. We have to strategically go in knowing that there will be no money made from this grocery store but it will impact the health of our population. And we build that grocery store and we support it. Let it be one of the reasons why we are in this neighborhood because we wanna help this neighborhood. There's so many, so much that we can do. And I believe as um, organization, especially bigger organizations that we can do this. When we hire also, we have to be strategic in hiring. If you are in a team and 10 of the people that you've hired are all Caucasian, are you telling me that you cannot see any African-American person that can fit into one of those roles that you are hiring? So let's be intentional, let's be strategic. And if they are all female, are you telling me there are no male that can fit into that? Or if you are an organization that have all African-American, there must be a Caucasian that can fit into so that we can learn from each other and work better. There's a lot to do. I'm gonna stop there for now. That was terrific. So this is big, right? This is complicated. There's not a single sector or do, sector of society or domain of life that isn't somehow connected with questions of health equity. Probably the most important thing we can sort of get conceptually is that health is not just about medicine. And once we grasp that, we can begin, all of us can begin kind of committing to and taking steps that can build equity. So what I want to do, because I want us to have a chance to hear from the audience and answer some questions from them, I'd like to just take a minute to go through the panel and have each of you real quick, maybe not with explanations, just if you could name three steps, three, three, three big or small things that you would see us do if we wanted to build health equity in Memphis, what would those be? And so if each of you can just take a minute to say one, two, three, these are the three things, what would those be? Mine is cultural humility is the first thing. I want every one of us to have cultural humility. The second one is to create a safe space that we can have this discussion that we're having right now. The third one is silence is no longer an option. If you see something, do something or it is no longer an option moving forward. So I, I, I you didn't say small, so I took big things. No, number one, we've, we've got to address poverty. 
Now that's a big umbrella term. So to bring that down to something specific is the financial insecurity of our households in Memphis. Second is education. That goes a little bit to the root cause of the financial security. And then the third, because I am in healthcare, is investing not only in primary care, but subspecialty care access. Right now we put a lot of the burden on hospital systems to address social determinants of health and they're frankly not positioned to do it like primary care and subspecialty care can. So I'll go and I'll take by more of a philosophical approach. I think the first thing we need to do is see others as ourselves. And that connects to cultural humility, but we have to be willing to do for others as we will want um, others to do for us. The second is to engage in dialogue, to really talk about the root issues that impact the outcomes locally. Even if we talk about social determinants, we have to go much deeper and deal with those um, history and perceptions that we have of each other and our lack of willingness to treat um, people equitably in our country. And then last is a willingness to move from there to changing policies and taking meaningful structural action. We can all do things individually, but ultimately we have to change the structures. And that is difficult and requires a commitment over time. I'll go next. So my first is we are each other's keepers. So it's not my problem, it's not your problem, it's all our problem. So that's one thing that when you're saying that somebody's infected is not my, the other person's problem, it's actually my problem and your problem. So everybody should wear their mask, especially when we're talking about COVID. It's not that you're protecting only yourself, but you're protecting some other people. My second is whenever you see somebody who's not complying, compliance to me is a big issue. And when you're seeing somebody's not complying in your eyes, you have to look, try and wear their shoes and see why is it that they're not complying? It's probably because they just don't have all the necessary resources for them to be able to comply to whatever policies that you're putting in place. So when we're putting policies in place, we need to think about how does it affect a person who doesn't have the resources to be able to do whatever we're putting in place. And then third is education, education, education. Educate people as much as possible on what's available to them and what they can, where they can get the resources that they need and also just to do right. Okay, I'll jump in. Um, of course, mine is gonna have to do with food, obviously, but I think um, it's just to make sure that the most vulnerable in our community have the food that they need to live a healthy life, nutritious food. So what does that mean? It may be an expansion of SNAP benefits. Um, some, some folks are getting a very small amount of SNAP. And so part of that is gonna be education. We know that, like I'd said before, 40% of our seniors don't get SNAP. They don't know about it. They don't know how to sign up. So we need more of an outreach on SNAP because the dollars that folks are spending on food, if they can use SNAP or benefit the food bank, then they have money in their budget to do the other things that they need to do. Um, I think um, new strong partners in the community that are our brick and mortar pantries. I think one of the issues that we have is a lot of them are run by volunteers. And so they're not going to be open five days a week or they, they don't, they can't or um, are not able to do a Saturday distribution. So we need more avenues to get food out into food deserts. We have, you all know of this, we have um, some areas that they don't have access to um, fresh produce or any kind of food at all that's not a Dollar General food. And um, that's where I think we need to make sure that we're targeting the neighborhoods that are food deserts. And I feel like our food bank has done a really good job of doing that. And then lastly, I would say nutrition education. It is part of the whole education, but when people don't know about nutrition and the benefits of it, they don't know how to prepare whatever type of food might be nutritious. They're just not used to it. No one's ever told them that. So I think nutrition education is also a very important part of our educating our community. Thank you. Okay, we have some terrific questions from our audience. And so we're where there's no way we're gonna get through all of these, but I'm just gonna to try to bring a few threads together. Several people ask things that are sort of similar. So one of them has to do that with the fact that a lot of our um, communities most affected by health disparities 
tend to have lower levels of trust with the agencies and institutions and organizations that might be able to provide services. So how do we go about building that trust and, um, and working towards sustainable and scalable solutions? I'll take that, Kendra, uh, Dr. Hose. Um, I think the first part of that question is we have a lot of resources that are never updated. So we send our vulnerable population or our neighbors to go to this place and that place and they get there. The place is not even in existence. So the thing, what we need to do first of all is to make sure that all the resources that we are given to them are being a, a just an accurate resource because it's frustrating when you're looking for food and somebody send you to a place and there is no food in that place. That's the first area. Second, we need to treat people with dignity. Because they're looking for food doesn't mean that you need to talk to them anyhow. You have to respect them and make sure that you are putting yourself, come with compassion to make sure that you are treating them the way you would like to be treated. That's how people build trust. That's how people know that people like them. And then we also have to tell our um, funders to donate money to all these places so that we can have the funds, we can have the, the things we are looking for. If there is no money to replenish all those things, those resources will not be there. Uh, go, ahead. That, go ahead, Jenny. Just, just to chime in on a, an observation I've made over the years, which is really more of a structural thing when it comes to helping populations access resources available to them, we often have the most complicated systems to access support for people who have the least amount of agency to navigate those systems. So when, particularly at Church Health, we know about disability or TIN care or all the different types of health coverage available for people, but this can often be the case when you have to apply for assistance through any of the other kinds of social service assistance programs. It's like we have, we require people to prove just how bad they need it instead of us trusting them, you know? And, and so that, I think that's just, that's a philosophical shift that could be very structural in um, having trust in these systems to make them easier to navigate and to believe people that if they say, I need help, they actually do, they don't have to prove it. And I'll speak from a public health um, perspective specifically, and some of the history of our agency within this community. I think first and foremost, we have to be committed to provide the services are needed, regardless of funding. And that seems somewhat difficult, but there is a history of money being poured into certain projects. And then when that money goes away, then agencies step back and communities then lose trust. You continue to lose trust over time. So really being committed to be present and in community, regardless of funding sources and to advocate for local funding. I would reinforce what Jenny said, the importance of being able to access services easily and not having systems that are so difficult to navigate. So again, I'll speak to public health. Many of you are aware of our main building. There is not parking here for customers. And we are investing in a new building and that new building will prioritize customer parking. What a novel concept. But those are the kind of things that we've done for generations that make people not feel welcome, particularly in government systems. And then reinforcing what Sandra said about really treating people with compassion and dignity and caring. And through that, you build trust over time, but it's important to stay present and then lastly, I would say is thinking of creative ways to hire people from the community, whether that's to have a community health worker role or other roles that we don't currently have, so that people then um, become part of the system and they can help change the system from within, but also the community can see and speak with people who represent them as well. And that's a, a very important piece. 
If I may just elaborate on the uh, just a couple of things the food bank does. Um, we are in an agreement with um, Feeding America because we're an affiliate of Feeding America and we have compliance things that we have to abide by. And because we're dealing with food, you know, we've got to have food safety and food safety training. But one of the things that we do when you go to either a mobile pantry or a brick and mortar pantry that is a partner of ours, you just self declare your income. We're not asking for a lot of income. You don't have to quote prove that you need it. If you're in line um, and you and you say you need food, you are to be given food with great respect. And that's part of our compliance with our agency. So we monitor our agencies and we do a lot of training customer service training to let them know how to treat the clients. I'm not going to say that someone hasn't been treated rudely and disrespectfully, but um, we we ensure as best we can that that doesn't happen with our clients. And of course, now during COVID, we don't really need anything. We're, a lot of the food, we're just, if you come in line, we're putting it in your trunk and you drive off. And I think that's the, the best way we can do that. And then secondly, I think that the getting the SNAP benefits can be somewhat complicated. So you've got to have, you know, it's online and then you have to physically sign a form. And so we are working in the background to make sure that we're making that as uncomplicated as we can possibly make it so that people can get their benefits. And then lastly, just when um, Dr. Halshalder was talking about um, continue that funding, um, and of course that's the, the stress every nonprofit CEO is under, right? How am I gonna make budget and how am I gonna cover all these expenses? So um, that is part of our job, I think as a nonprofit, you have to make sure you're working really hard in the background with funders and, um, letting, and telling your story and running a tight ship so that people do trust you and they know that if they donate to you that you're using the money for what you said you were going to do so i do think that um that the food bank again i walked into a great situation because we were already respected but my job of course moving forward is to make sure we stay that way but um but we take all of those responsibilities very seriously as an educator I think we also have to think about, you know, majority of the students come from our areas. So we have to be the advocates to our students, not just providing education. So one thing Baptist is doing is providing food. Like, of course, Kathy, you have the food bank, but as educators, we also are responsible to making sure we take care of our students who are local residents of our community. So apart from just being educators, we have to be supporters and the advocates for those students who come to us every day. We have a question from the audience that I'm actually going to turn around a little bit and ask of the panelists. The, the, the audience was asking, so what, um, what, what are each of you doing in your setting um, as people who have some degree of social power? What I want to do is turn that question around, actually, because I think we've had a chance now to hear from each of you a little bit about what your organizations are doing. Let's ask that question of our audience. So I'm going to take a wild guess that people who have showed up to celebrate what's right, have some degree of social power. And um, the question is, what, what do we want them to do? What do we want them to support? So audience, we're talking to you here, gonna get a little bossy. And I'm gonna ask just like in one sentence, what is one thing you would ask our audience to do or to support that would make a difference in building health equity here in Memphis. So I'm gonna give a quick uh, example. I would encourage everyone paying attention to figure out how we can do a better job with public transportation and support efforts to fund MATA so that we know our lowest income residents can get where they need to be. And that helps with employment, that helps with getting access to healthcare. Now I've taken up way more than one sentence. So transportation. <laughs> I'm gonna do this the way we do in my class. I'm gonna pass to the next person and ask you to pass to the person after you. So I'm gonna pass to Elisa. What would be the one thing you would ask our audience to do or support? I think the one thing that I would ask our audience to do is really to focus on uh, advancing a living wage for all people. I think if people have a living wage, they can then um, 
have agency themselves and begin to advocate for things like transportation, education, and so on. I'm going right across the top of my screen. Lillian, what would be the one thing you would do? Healthcare, providing healthcare. Well, I don't wanna say healthcare for all because people will probably come at me with that, but having people being able to just have access to healthcare in an easier way without paying so much money for it. Kathy, one thing. About the transportation? Just one thing you would ask our audience to commit to. Um, well, I would, I would ask them to commit to um, supporting nonprofits in our community that are really doing great work and to know that um, just like a for-profit, we have bills that we have to pay. And, and the best way um, is what is it that you love? What are you passionate about? And make sure that you are intentionally involved um, in our community in that way. Sandra. Because I'm in healthcare and that has been taken. Food insecurity is my big thing. To be able to put in grocery stores so that people can eat and be healthy. Very good. And Jenny. I am a huge believer in education and I would ask everyone to fully believe with all their heart that the next doctor, lawyer, bank president, president of the United States, mayor of Memphis is just as likely to come from Whitehaven or Orange Mound, North Memphis as from Germantown. And if we don't invest in educating all of our children, we are wasting resources that will turn our city into the next dream it is supposed to be. Dr. Holmes, I really wanna encourage, there are funders that are, I think there are funders in our midst to tell them thank you for all the things they've been doing already. I don't want us to finish this without thanking our funders that have been dedicated to supporting our pro, all the programs that are going on in the city, giving us money and helping us do this. I don't want to mention their names. They know themselves. Please keep do, doing the good job. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you to all of our panelists. This has been really illuminating and I think we have some marching orders here. Now I need to turn back to the new Memphis um, crew and ask them, this is embarrassing. I'm not sure what's next. I'm the moderator. I probably should. <laughs> No worries there. Um, thank you everyone just for attending today. Um, we've had a very dynamic conversation about this. And as they kind of mentioned, the show continues with you. Um, so I will just mention one more time that if you wouldn't mind um, filling out our survey, um, you can either take a picture of that now um, and let us know what your thoughts are and what kind of steps you would like to take going forward. Um, and we'll all work, you know, march forward together. Um, as you know, Kendra and the panelists all noted, there's a lot of different steps that we can take. Um, and there's a lot of different organizations that are already working diligently to um, really make the make health equity achievable in our community. Um, so we'll send you some specific organizations, but I do wanna just call that we do have an event coming up on September 1st or 901 day, in which all of these organizations will be in one place and you can sign up to volunteer. You can ask how you can donate. You can ask how you can advocate for them. And all of that is just easy to do and something that you can do right away. Um, you know, as we've already mentioned, you can put in the work to ensure healthcare is accessible. We have organizations like Church Health um, that kind of lead in that space. You can open up your wallet and purchase and, or, and donate um, items to encourage healthy households. So, you know, whether it's the food bank, whether it's the Hope House or Dorothy Day House or all of these organizations that work to help our homeless population um, or those that need a little extra support. You can help the next generation of Memphians see their future. So, um, you know, you can, there's a lot of the SEO programs that offer free eye care and things like that. Um, you can give your time and feed your neighbor. Again, we have so many different partner organizations that work with Mid-South Food Bank um, to make sure that everybody in our community is fed and that we're eradicating our food deserts. And then you can work to strengthen the awareness and um, 
and you know just keep being a community advocate um, for mental health resources in our community something that has in the past kind of um, been ignored and that we want to march forward together so we'll send you specific organizations but as a reminder um, on september 1st you can meet them all in one place um, thank you all for being here today. Thank you again to our amazing sponsors, First Horizon Foundation, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Tennessee. Um, and we hope to see you at our next Celebrate What's Great on October 20th, which we'll dive into education, which we know from today is a super important topic as well. And um, so I hope you all take that charge, lead the way in the health equity space, and we will see you at the next event. Thank you for your time. Thank you.